In this episode of Anti-Aging Hacks, we discuss how memories are formed, short-term and long-term memories, and how to keep our memories in top-notch condition using nutrition and lifestyle. Welcome to Anti-Aging Hacks. On this podcast, I interview top experts in anti-aging and longevity, and we discuss the best natural and medical solutions to bring you practical advice you can apply right now to fight back against aging. We also discuss sneak peeks at some huge scientific advancements coming in the near future that will allow us to age backwards. I am your host, Faraz Khan. Thank you for spending some time with me today. My guest today, Dr. Deb Matthew, is an award-winning speaker on the topic of wellness and hormones. Dr. Deb is a diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Medicine and the American Board of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine, for whom she's a frequent lecturer. She has appeared on ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox TV News and talk shows frequently as an expert medical guest. Dr. Matthew, I'm excited to be talking with you. Welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Well, it's great to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you today. So let's start with your background. Where did you go to school and how did you get interested in medicine? You know, I grew up in Canada and my father is a doctor. And so when I was growing up, my part-time job was working in his medical office, doing medical dictations and filing. So I've kind of been around medicine my whole life. And um, I always kind of knew that I wanted to do something in medicine. I thought that I was going to do sports medicine because I was really interested in health and fitness. And this whole area of anti-aging medicine, functional medicine didn't exist at that time, really. Uh, But I was interested in this kind of thing right from the beginning. In fact, I even worked as a fitness trainer before I went to medical school. Really cool. My parents, quick a backstory. My parents tried to get me to go to medical school for years and years, and I just wouldn't do it. I wasn't interested. And full circle now, I'm coming back and doing an anti-aging hacks podcast. So it's quite ironic. <laughs> um, but good to know that you were interested from the get-go. So you're a very accomplished doctor as well as a prolific speaker and an author as well. What led you to start specializing in and speaking about anti-aging and health issues? In my own life, I wasn't feeling good. And I was tired all the time. I wanted to have naps whenever possible. Like napping was my favorite thing in the whole world. And I was anxious for no reason. I would wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. I was cold all the time. I took a sweater everywhere I went, even in July, because the air conditioning would cause me to just freeze. And I knew that how I was feeling wasn't normal, but there was nothing. How old were you? Well, I was in my mid-30s, but I had been tired since I was in my 20s. And nothing in my medical training helped me to understand what was going on with me. And so it wasn't until I learned about this whole area of functional medicine, and anti-aging medicine, that it all made sense. And my first introduction is actually my husband found a book that was written by Suzanne Summers on bioidentical hormones. And um, you can just imagine, right, doctors don't like to get their medical information from celebrities. And I wasn't really yeah. too interested in the book in the first place. But but I knew that it was hard on him. I wasn't the best version of me. I was hard to get along with. And he's the one that kind of bore the brunt of a lot of my, you know, Wicked Witch of the West impersonation. <laughs> and, but, yeah. but so I read the book. And that book really opened my mind to this whole idea that prescribing drugs to treat diseases is really not the only way to practice medicine. And if we can help people get well then they can have a much better quality of life. So now I devote my career to helping men and women get well, get off their prescription medicines and love the way they feel by addressing the root cause of whatever their health issues may be. How long had you been married married at that time? Uh, We've been married for over 10 years. So you had kids? Yeah, I have four kids. And so that's part of the problem, right? Already I'm tired. I don't feel good. And then on top of that, I'm not sleeping through the night and I got to deal with the kids. It's just a lot of stress. And that just made everything worse. And if I'd gone, you know, I didn't go to the doctor because I know what they would have done. But normally if you go to the doctor, they're going to give you an antidepressant or a sleeping pill or an anxiety pill. But that doesn't really fix the root cause of the problem. That just kind of puts a Band-Aid over the symptom. Yeah, it's it's so crazy. In Western medicine, it's all about putting Band-Aids, right? And I think it is. finally the pendulum is shifting the other way where we're trying to go integrative and holistic. And of course, it's going to take a long time because we've got to get the insurance system aligned with that. But 
Uh, where do you think we are on that on that swing of the pendulum? I have a lot of um, a lot of optimism here because I I am on a mission to change the practice of medicine. When I first started doing this, I've been practicing this kind of medicine since 2006. I was one of the only people in my city doing it. My other doctor friends thought that I was really bonkers, but now I see that more and more doctors are learning about it. There's more places the doctors can go to be trained, and so the more doctors who learn about it, the more they can help more people. And the internet has changed everything too, because now you don't need your doctor all the time for every question. You can go on the internet and sometimes you end up knowing more than your doctor does about some of these things. So patients are going into their doctor to say, I went on a gluten-free diet and I feel so much better. And that IBS you've been trying to help me with for 10 years is gone now. So I feel really optimistic and positive that we're moving in the right direction. And that's one of my passions is to try to help doctors learn how to practice medicine this way so that they can transition. And the more doctors we can get doing this, the more the you know momentum builds and the more this will become kind of standard of care medicine. That's really my hope. Awesome. So I'll ask you one more question on that. And when folks come to see you, how is your practice or how you diagnose issues or health challenges different from how a traditional medical doctor would? Oh, that's such a good question. So a traditional medical doctor will listen to your symptoms. Maybe they'll run a test or two. And what they're trying to do is answer the question, what? What is the diagnosis? So maybe the diagnosis is anxiety or constipation or insomnia or high cholesterol or high blood pressure. And then once they've got the diagnosis, then they look up in their book, what's the best drug for this diagnosis? And they write you the prescription. So instead, what we really want to be doing is asking the question, why? Why is your blood pressure up? Why are you feeling anxious? You know, why are you not sleeping? Why are you constipated? So then we want to fix whatever it is that's the cause of your symptom. So your symptom goes away and you don't need the drug. I just called uh, the traditional doctors a traditional medical doctor. Am I going to be banned from speaking to doctors from now on? Is that an insult? (laughs) <laughs> I don't think so. The thing is, the traditional med- medical doctors or conventional medical doctors or whatever you want to call them, they're not even part of this conversation. They don't know They don't know that you and I are having this conversation today. So they just consider yeah. themselves doctors. Um, and anybody that's doing anything a little bit different, they sort of disregard, unfortunately. Okay, let me. we could talk about a lot of topics today, but I want to focus on memory, which happens to be one of your specialties. Can you explain to our audience, Dr. Matthew, how memories are formed? Sure. So when something happens, your brain files that memory away, especially in your frontal cortex. And typically it's filed in terms of, you know, what you saw, what did it sound like, what did it smell like, etc. And it's stored as a short-term memory in your frontal cortex but your hippocampus is the part of your brain that's responsible for transitioning it into a long-term memory. And it's this transition into a long-term memory that's really important. Otherwise, you'll just forget it right away, right? Like you look up somebody's phone number, you can remember it long enough to dial the phone, and then it's kind of gone. And there are a lot of things that affect how your body stores that as a long-term memory. So for example, Um, if there is more emotion surrounding the situation, you are much more likely to end up storing that as a long-term memory. And I know, I remember when I was a teenager, I went to see the movie Silence of the Lambs, and it was really a horrifying movie. And I remember what time of day it was, what time of year it was. I remember walking out of the movie theater. I can see, you know, the parking lot because I was in such an emotional state. And, And also a lot of people can remember like, you know, when, when Elvis died or when Princess Diana died or what, where they were when they heard about 9-11 because the emotion kind of solidifies that. And um, another thing that can affect whether something becomes a long-term memory is whether you use that memory over and over again. So if you dial the phone number over and over and over, it is much more likely that you're going to create a long-term memory because the pathways in your brain that are responsible for remembering that thing get stronger and stronger the more you use that memory. Got it. So how long is there, do we know how long short-term memories are stored and how long long long-term memories are stored? Well, short-term memories are stored for a short period of time. So seconds to minutes to Mm -hmm. hours, Mm -hmm. whereas long-term memories are indefinite. So 
especially, you know, older people, they often have really good recollections of what happened when they were really little, even if they don't have very good recollections of what they ate for lunch yesterday. Mm, got it. And so when we have all of these long-term memories being stored, I remember talking to folks where they're like, oh, go back to when you're five years old and think about your first memory. And those are very hard to retrieve. I, I assume that all these long-term memories are sitting there in our, in our brain, but it's the retrieval is the problem. How, what are some ways to retrieve memories better? So the pathways, the, the connections between your brain cells, you know, we, we need to access that in order to be able to pull the memory out. So th thinking about that thing over and over again helps to make those pathways stronger so that you're more likely to remember. So for example, if there was a picnic when you were seven and you saw pictures of that picnic over and over again while you're growing up, that helps to keep that memory reinforced. Whereas if you have the picnic when you're seven and you don't think about it for 30 years, and then you try to remember, you're much less likely you know, to have much memory of that particular circumstance. Sleep is another really important factor if you want to um, retain memories. So when you're when you're learning new things, new memories are going into your brain. If you sleep soundly, you're much more likely that those memories will end up being retained as long-term memories. Whereas if you have insomnia, you're much less likely. So this is also relevant when people are studying. You know, we tend to cram at the last minute and you're trying to shove as many things in your short-term memory, but sometimes short-term memory doesn't last long enough to get through the exam. And so if you have a good night's sleep and, um, you know, those, those things that you crammed the night before are actually much more likely that you're going to be able to remember them, you know, the next day when the exam comes. Man, I, I wish I'd known that through college because uh. <laughs> uh, we were scr scrambling to the last second. And then you'd remember kind of parts or most of the, the exam. And then literally the day after, you would have no idea what transpired, right? What you had crammed into your memory. So which is a bummer because the, the point of education is, is that you take that knowledge with you, not forget it the next morning. That's right. The point of, of learning at school is not really just to pass the exam. It's supposed to be enriching your life. And, and if you only remember it for one day, it's not very helpful. Right, exactly. So we're saying that we have pretty much unlimited long-term memory storage. Is there a way to kind of guides so if there's a memory we want to remember could you kind of like trick it into the brain somehow to to be able to access it better like you said yes. so the more that you think about something the more the pathways of that memory will become ingrained in your brain so if you think about learning a new language the more you you know say the word over and over again think about it in um it, the more it gets ingrained in your brain and another thing is if you can hook up a, me a new memory to some old memories, it also makes it easier to remember. So for example, um, if you, if you um, went on vacation in France, and so you remember being at the Eiffel Tower, so you got some memories of France, and then somebody gives you a new factoid about France, and you think about, oh, when you were standing at the Eiffel Tower and you saw somebody and, and whatever the new thing you learned kind of fits in with that memory, it's much easier than if somebody told you a factoid about Japan and you don't really know very much about Japan. So if you, if you already know some things about something and, and you add to it, it's easier. So if you um, have to learn somebody's name, that's a really common thing, right? It goes in your short-term memory and you forgot it by the next day. But if you think about um, like associations, so you know, if the person is really tall and their name is Trevor and you could think they're tall like a tree, you know, T-R-E, Trevor, so you're hooking the memories together. It's actually easier to remember those things long term. That is fascinating that you brought that up because I believe in my early 20s, I read a couple of memory books and they would do the same thing, right? There were some of these speakers that could memorize or remember uh, hundreds of names in one sitting and they were doing exactly that. They were associating it to something either outlandish or something already in their minds so they could then look at that person and say, oh, yeah, here's the association. I know how to get to your name, and I can retrieve it in, in three seconds or two seconds. Yeah. So, um, so that's great. Now, what causes brain fog in your opinion? So there are a lot of things. And I got to say, that is one of the really common things that people complain about when they come to see me is brain fog. And if you've never had brain fog, then you may not really understand what it is. But if you've had brain fog, you know exactly what it is, right? You just feel 
fuzzy and, and not as sharp as you should. So one of the common things that can do this is lack of sleep. So if you're either not getting enough hours of sleep because you stay up too late and get up too early, or if you're not sleeping soundly through the night because you got kids that are waking you up, or you know you got to get up to pee four times, or if your significant other is snoring all night long, um, that's another thing that can do it. Chronic stress is a big one. When you have stress, stress causes cortisol to go up. That's the hormone that helps you cope with stress. And um, when stress levels are off, that can cause brain fog. Another really common one is inflammation. So what I'm talking about here is inflammation that's just kind of going through your bloodstream. So, you know, if you sprain your ankle and your ankle gets all swollen up, it's inflamed. Or if you have, you know, a sore on your arm that's gotten infected, it's inflamed. But those are just local. So here we're talking about inflammatory chemicals that are going through your bloodstream and they go everywhere, including to your brain. So when your brain is inflamed, you can't remember things, you can't think straight, you can't focus, you feel tired. Um, and that's a really big one. Um, and, and there's a long list of other things, toxins in the environment, um, women who are going through hormone changes like PMS and perimenopause and um, heading towards menopause. So um, so there's a, a big long list of what causes brain fog. So when somebody comes in, I don't just suggest trying this supplement or that supplement for the brain fog. We really need to dig to figure out for you what are the underlying causes because, of course, the treatment will be different. Agreed 100%. I've been focusing a lot on my sleep because I notice that when I don't get enough sleep, or I wake up to pee a couple of times, for example, to go to the restroom, I I have brain fog and I can't remember things as well as I should, and I'm not on point. So that's certainly something I'm working on fixing. But also, let's touch on chronic inflammation for a second. This has got to be the biggest epidemic of our generation. What typically causes chronic inflammation, and does it easily cross the blood-brain barrier? So let me answer the second part of the question first. So yes, it crosses the blood brain barrier and it causes a lot of symptoms like the brain fog, like depression, like anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, poor focus. And of course we got pills for all those things, right? So you can have an antidepressant, a sleeping pill, et cetera. But if inflammation is the underlying problem, that's not really the best solution. And just like the brain fog, there's all kinds of different things that can cause inflammation. So a poor diet, too much sugar in your diet, the bad kinds of fats, not getting any exercise, being too stressed out, being exposed to plastics and other chemicals in the environment. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of different factors that cause inflammation. And that really for all of us should be one of our goals is to be more anti-inflammatory because if we're here, the topic is anti-aging, inflammation just ages you at an accelerated rate. So we need to be relatively more anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And the test, the best test for testing for inflammation is the C-reactive protein test, correct? That's the test that I do the most often. And part of the reason is that it's one that we can sort of routinely get from most labs, Often it's covered by your health insurance. We know where it should be. But there are many, many inflammatory chemicals in the body. So even if you have your CRP level done and it comes back and it looks great, it really doesn't guarantee that your body doesn't have too much inflammation. It, it's much more complex than just a CRP. But that would be the first test that I would do. Is that done on a regular blood panel when you go to see your traditional doctor? Not typically. So... Some, I mean, it sometimes can be done, especially if your doctor already knows that you're either at really high risk for heart disease or you already have heart disease, but it's the exception, not the rule. It would not be a routine thing. Yeah. I don't believe I've ever seen a CRP reading on my blood test that my doctor's ordered. And given the environment that we live in and the toxicity around us, I would assume that this would be a standard metric of biomarkers that all doctors start to at least test for. Well, so one of the challenges is that it's coming back to insurance. Your insurance will only pay for labs that diagnose a disease. And CRP, first of all, isn't really diagnosed. Inflammation isn't a disease. And then plus, we don't really have a drug to treat it. So if your doctor orders the CRP, the, the insurance company's way of thinking would be you order a test to diagnose a problem. So then the problem gets treated with the drug. And since that doesn't quite fit into the category, it's not routinely done, which is a shame because 
if people knew, you know, if you had more warning, then you could do something about it. Whereas if you wait until you have a heart attack, then they start checking your CRP, you know, you're a couple decades behind the ball. Right, right. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's too late, but you've missed a you've lot missed. of opportunities. Exactly. Now, it's so interesting you say that because insurance is like, okay, figure out the issue so you can push a pill or you can give them something to fix it immediately, right, without looking at the root cause. And if it's not easy to figure out the root cause, then insurance is not interested as much? You know, they do pay lip service to the fact that they would like, um, you know, to to try to prevent things. And they want, you know, mammograms, etc. But a lot of the things that they're promoting are things that are diagnosing something that you already have, right? Like if you go have a mammogram and it's normal, then good, we got nothing for you. Wait to, you know, keep doing it until it's wrong. And then we'll do something about it. And the same thing with your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is normal, then fine, we got nothing for you. But if it's up, well, then we got a pill. So instead of talking to you about all the things that you should be doing to make sure it stays down or to make sure that your breasts stay healthy, um, but, it, but it's kind of backwards thinking. Even in my community, the hospital system has made a big announcement that they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to open more hospitals and, and you know, x-ray centers and things like that, when they really could have spent those hundreds of millions of dollars taking the people that they've got and making them healthier so that they wouldn't need more hospitals and x-rays. Absolutely agreed. So we talked about brain fog. There's also memory recall, which... Sometimes when I don't sleep well, and I've noticed this, sometimes it takes me three seconds to come up with the word or the name that I should know at the tip of my tongue. And this, I I wouldn't say it happens often, but it happens once in a while. And I go, why is that happening? Oh, I didn't sleep well. So what causes memory recall issues? You have to have enough energy in your brain in order for all the little neurons to fire properly in order to come up with the energy. And there's a whole bunch of things that interfere, right? So like you said, when you haven't slept, then your brain is just not sharp and you're not on the ball. And another really big one is when you're stressed. Because when cortisol goes up with stress, cortisol interferes with your hippocampus, which is that part of your brain responsible for memory. And when, you know, you may have had that, like the extreme experience, like if your boss comes in and, you know, they're really upset about something and they start firing questions off at you and you kind of freeze and your brain freezes and you can't even think of the simplest answers. So that's kind of an extreme example. But, you know, in general, when we are more stressed, um, we just can't recall those memories as well. And so, um, a lot of times we know what we're stressed about. It's emotional stress. We're worried. We're busy. But sometimes it's stresses that we don't really think about, like physical stresses, like back pain or um, physiologic stresses like allergies or insomnia or um, food allergies or when urinary tract infection. So when there's something going on in your body, that counts as a stressor. And you may not put two and two together, but if cortisol levels change, your memory may not be so good. So a lot of these things, things are lifestyle factors that we actually have control over as we a, another factor is hormones so for men as testosterone levels start to decline and we're seeing a lot of low testosterone even in younger men partly because of the environmental chemicals and also in women um, you know starting from our 30s our hormone levels start to decline too and bad memory is one of the more common things that people complain about especially word finding you know you can't think of that person's name or you start to say you know the what call it cuz you know or the the, the the drawer with the files in it cuz you can't think of the word filing cabinet so as our hormones change that's a real another really significant factor in being able to pull out the memories that you want and you know, my son just turned 16. He's got his driver's license. And so if he walks out of the mall, oh, well, that's a good or a bad, right? But when he walks out of the mall and he can't remember where he parked his car, he just laughs. But, you know, as you start to get older, it's not quite so funny anymore. And you start to worry, like, is this the first sign of, you know, dementia? Am I getting Alzheimer's? <laughs> um, but a lot of times it's just a matter that we were stressed. How does memory get affected as we age since you brought that up? Yeah, so as we age one of the things that changes in our body, well, there's a, there's a few things, but one of them that changes is there's a chemical in our brain called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is really important for our memory. So as acetylcholine levels start to naturally go down with age, it can be harder and harder for us to retrieve memories. 
Another thing that changes as we age is naturally our bodies do tend to become more inflamed. And we already talked about how inflammation is bad for your memory. As we age naturally, cortisol levels change. So cortisol goes up in most people with age, whereas estrogen and testosterone and um, progesterone, which would help memory, those ones go down. Um, so another thing that happens as we age is our hippocampus tends to shrink. So, you know, your bones get thinner as you age, our height, you know, we tend to shrink all of parts of us. And so our hippocampus tends to shrink too. And that's another really important factor with being able to pull those memories out. Is the decline swift or does it happen gradually over decades? Yeah, it would be really gradually. So it would be the kind of thing that, you know, it's hard to notice because it's very slow. But if you're doing good things with your life, you know, if you're living a healthy lifestyle and taking care of yourself, you can help to slow that process. And if you're doing all the wrong things, then you can speed it up. I see. What can we do then to keep our memory in top-notch condition as we start to age? Yeah. So the good news is there is a ton that we can do in order to help with memory. So first, let's talk about food. And let's talk about the, the good things to do first and then the things that we don't want you to do. So there are a few foods that are considered superfoods that are especially good for your memory. So one of them would be dark green leafy vegetables. So things like spinach and kale and those kinds of things. So those are full of vitamins and your brain cells need those vitamins in order to stay healthy. And there was a study that was done that looked at people who ate more dark green leafy vegetables. So these are people who ate at least one serving of dark green leafy vegetables per day. And they compared them to the people who were eating the least, which would be like not at all. And on this memory test, you know, they, the people eating the leafy greens, it was as though their brains were 11 years younger than whatever their chronological age was. So 11 years younger, like if there was a drug that could make your brain 11 years younger, would you not take that drug? All day. But green leafy vegetables. The second one is fish. So omega-3s, right, are found in fish. And omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory. So they reduce inflammation. We know that's good. But also your brain is mostly made of fat. And the, the predominant fat in your brain is called DHA, which is one of the omega-3s that's found in fish. And there was a study that looked at people who ate four servings of fish per week. They had memory scores that were as though their brain was four years younger than their actual age. A really important thing, though, is it's really important that the fish is wild caught and not farm raised because if you're eating farm raised fish, it's fed fish chow. You know, it's it's not eating a natural diet. Yeah. And so those fish don't really have good omega-3s. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about smaller versus larger fish? I think folks are talking about mackerel or anchovies or some of these smaller fish because they don't have as much mercury. Do you have a, a stance on that? Yes, you are. Absolutely. Yes, you are totally correct. The smaller fish, sardines. So some people don't care for them as much because they are fatty fish, but it's that fatty fish that's so good for your brain. The next one would be fruits and vegetables that are high in antioxidants. So, you know, all the different colors of the rainbow, but in particular, blueberries. And the reason that blueberries in particular is because the anthocyanidins, the antioxidants in blueberries can cross to your brain better than many of the other ones. And so blueberries are especially high in this kind of antioxidant that can cross to your brain. So there was a study that showed that women who ate two servings of blueberries per week had memory scores as though they were two and a half years younger than the women who eat the least blueberries. So the next one is what kind of fat? So we talked about omega-3s, but the next one is called medium chain triglycerides or MCT, and that's what's found in coconut. So there's a little bit of controversy around coconut because coconut is saturated fat, which only means that it's a solid at room temperature. But unlike the kind of saturated fat in red meat, coconut is actually really good for you. And it's especially good for your brain because your liver can convert this MCT, this um, healthy fat in the coconut oil, to something called ketones. So a lot of people are talking about the keto diet, right? Um, but ketones are really great fuel for your brain. So there's a lot of research going on right now. I don't have any studies to tell you how many years it makes your brain younger, but there's a lot of research on how um, ketones are good for your brain and coconut oil contains ketones. Um, 
So in terms of things that we don't want you, well, actually I've got one more that we want you to eat and that's egg yolks. So, you know, for a long time, we told people to go for the egg whites because egg yolks have cholesterol, but cholesterol, it turns out is actually really important for your brain and people with the lowest levels of cholesterol have the highest rates of dementia. So eggs are not bad for you. And choline in particular, um, which is found in egg yolks, is important for that chemical acetylcholine that we said was really important for memory, and it tends to go down with age. So eating eggs is also another really good one for your brain. Got it. So let me ask you a follow-on question on eggs, because when you go to the grocery aisle, there is, I, I think now, 10 to 12 types of eggs. Some of them are organic, some of them are pasture-raised, some of them are nothing, and it goes in price from, I don't know, a couple of dollars to like $7 for 12 eggs. Um, I've been eating a lot of pasture-raised organic, but those are also expensive eggs. What do you recommend to get the best benefits of acetylcholine and other nutrients found in the egg yolks? Yeah, I think you're doing the right thing. So um, when you're you know, trying to figure out where to spend your grocery dollars, I believe that it's most important to buy the highest quality when we're buying animal products. So of course, it's better to buy organic broccoli and the other vegetables. But when you're buying... Um, meat or fish or eggs or cheese or milk, if you can go for the organic, pastured, um, the healthiest option that you can, it really is worth the extra dollars because you really are going to get a better quality nutrition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so those would be the ones that um, I would say are um, uh, some really good ones. And some other ones that are really great for your brain that have lots of antioxidants are kind of fun things like chocolate is really high in antioxidants and studies have shown that it's good for your brain and for memory. Even coffee is good for your memory because it's got lots of antioxidants, but that's another one where you really kind of want to get the healthiest coffee that you can. Um, some coffees have contaminants and they're grown in countries that use a lot of really bad pesticides. Um, green tea is another one that's full of antioxidants and um, so including some of these in your diet is good for your brain. And another category of things that's really good for your brain is spices. So especially curcumin, which is from the root called turmeric, it's very anti-inflammatory. That's what make cur makes curry powder yellow. And we've got a fair amount of research to show that the anti-inflammatory effects of curcumin are really good to protect your brain. Um, and then there's a few things that we want you to avoid. So the most important one, the top of my list would be sugar. And sugar is very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, sugar drives your hormones out of whack. So insulin is a hormone that regulates your blood sugar. And the more sugar you eat, the more you throw insulin out of whack. Insulin causes you to gain weight, especially around your belly. So we, we really want a healthy blood sugar metabolism. And in order to have that, sugar really just needs to be limited. So it's okay to eat fruit and get the sugar from fruit. It's okay to enjoy treats sometimes, but really on a regular basis, we really want to do our best to eat the least amount of sugar possible. Um, another one that's really bad for your brain is trans fat. So that would be margarine and um, uh, cooking um, shortening like Crisco. Um, those kinds of things are very inflammatory. And so, of course, the opposite of what we want. They are also very bad for insulin and blood sugar. They make you gain weight. So fat itself is good. We've already talked about um, omega-3s. We've talked about coconut oil. Extra virgin olive oil is good. Nuts and seeds and avocados, those are all healthy fats we want you to eat for your brain. But trans fat is really the problem, and that's what we really want you to avoid. So deep fried foods, all that oil in the fryer, even if when they pour it in, it's not trans fat. Sometimes they'll say, right, that they, they don't use trans fat in their cooking oil. But when they heat it to a high heat, a lot of the fats get converted into trans fat because of the heat. So deep fried foods aren't the best choice. Yeah, agreed. Uh, quick question on that. Yeah. There's obviously different types of oils. Some folks recommend not cooking your food at all. And others say, well, if you must, then lightly saute in oil and use a coconut or avocado oil because it's got a high smoke point. And don't use olive oil because it doesn't have that much of a high smoke point. Any uh, guidelines on that? Yeah, so I agree exactly with what you're saying. The higher the heat, the more the food gets um, um, 
changed in ways that aren't so good. So I don't tell people that they need to eat a completely raw diet. There's, you know, there's only so many people that are willing to do that, but, but cooking your heat, cooking your food using lower heat, you know, like sauteing and, and things like that is preferable over the high heat. And you're absolutely right. Coconut oil, avocado oil have a higher heat point. They're less likely to be um, converted into trans fats and less likely to be oxidized. Whereas olive oil is great. You know, if you, if you steam green beans, it's okay to pour some olive oil over the green beans afterwards um, in order to make them tastier. And that's great. And same thing with coconut oil, melt coconut oil over your vegetables, even organic butter is okay. Melt it over your vegetables. All those years we used to do it. And then we told you not to do it. Everybody got right. used to banning butter, but it turns mm -hmm. out it's good for your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, one other thing you said on the sugar and the insulin, what I found when I, a few years ago, you know, I used to be a regular guy that worked out and that ate high carbohydrate diets. And in the afternoon after lunch, I would get the slump, right? It'd be, there'd be yawning. There'd be, oh my God, I need some coffee. It's 2 p.m. And so you'd need to, you'd, you'd get that high slump, the high sugar, and then the, the crash after. And so you'd have to go get coffee to fix it. And when I switched to the ketogenic diet, all of that went away. I had stable energy all day for the first time. I wasn't yawning in the afternoon. And I don't do ketogenic diet all the time. I, I think I'm keto adapted and I stay close. Like I have 100 or 200 grams of carbs. But I have 40 to 60% of my diet as, as fats anymore. And I really, it's made a huge difference in my energy and just being on all day long. That's great. What happens to most people is that they're eating tons of carbohydrates all day long. And so they can't access their stored fat for fuel. So they depend on whatever they ate last. And as soon as they burn up that, you know, carbs from the last meal, then they're just hungry again. And if you don't have the right amount of fuel in your cells, then you're going to feel tired. You get these blood sugar swings, right? You eat something starchy and your blood sugar goes way up and then it crashes down. And so that's the average American. They're functioning on these crazy blood sugar swings and they're gaining more weight because the insulin tells their body to store fat, but it also blocks them from being able to burn the fat for energy when they need it. So when you go on a ketogenic diet, you're training your cells to go back to burning the fat so that in between meals, right, even if you're not overweight, um, you know, the average healthy person is going to have plenty of fat stores in their body to be able to provide them with some extra energy until supper time. So that's a really common thing is that when you're hooked on eating the sugar a lot, then you need, you get these cravings. You can't help yourself. You need sugar. Otherwise you need a nap or, you know, you get cranky and hangry, right? But if you can get yourself off sugar, which, you know, it, it takes a little bit. It can take a week or so, you know, of getting over those sugar cravings. But the sugar cravings go away. And then it's easy and you don't miss it. And you just feel so much better. And it's so much better for your brain and your memory and your focus and your energy. Agreed. Okay. What else should we avoid for brain health? So the, the, another one, I, let me add this one, is aspartame. So artificial sweeteners, Right. Aspir so a lot of people, they're tr they know they're not supposed to eat sugar, so they're trying to be good, so then they go to aspartame. But aspartame is a neurotoxin. It's really bad for your brain. It's bad for your memory. So if you're trying to stay sharp and on the ball, you definitely want to avoid artificial sweeteners and especially aspartame. We want to avoid too much alcohol. So it's okay to have a little bit of alcohol sometimes, but but too much alcohol is just a toxin for your brain. So, so, and And I don't recommend that people start drinking alcohol on purpose for their health. But if you enjoy having a little bit of alcohol, a little bit is okay, but too much is not okay. And then processed foods, just as sort of a big category, we, we want you to eat whole foods. So fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and, you know, pasture eggs, but not, um, you know, the, the things that come in packages, you know, the, the um, snack cakes and donuts and and the things that have a list of ingredients that are so long, and most of them are chemicals, partly because you're not getting good nutrition that your brain needs, and partly because a lot of those chemicals are not good for our bodies. But, you know, it's interesting that many of the chemicals that are found in our food were never tested to make sure they're safe. We honestly don't really understand all the things that they do to us. And unfortunately, the burden is really on the consumer to prove that they've been harmed by something instead of the burden being on the food companies to prove that their product is safe.
So if you eat whole foods, you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So that's a lot of very good advice on what to eat and what to avoid. Is there a lifestyle or exercise advice that you might also consider offering? Yes. Yeah, so exercise has got to be one of the most important things that you can do for your brain and for your memory. When you exercise, you get the blood pumping, you get more oxygen to your brain to feed those brain cells, you get the nutrients to your brain, and you create something in your brain called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And BDNF is like miracle grow for your brain cells. So it's really connecting all those um, those connections between the brain cells that are going to help to keep your memories sharp. So this is something that if you do this for your, you know, over your lifetime, you're really going to do a good job keeping your memory sharp. Um, so exercise has got to be one of the best anti-aging treatments around. Another really important one is managing stress in a healthy way because too much stress causes cortisol problems. That's bad for your memory. And the trick here is it's not so much how much stress you have in your life. And it's more about how you allow the stress to affect you. So if you're somebody who just kind of relives that, you know, conversation over and over again, and you, you, know, you keep telling the story in your head, I can't believe she said that to me, you're taking that situation and you're just making it way worse. But if you take the same situation and you're able to see the positive, you know, let it go, move past it, that same situation is much less. And a trick is, Whenever you're really upset about something and you're feeling all stressed out, if you can catch yourself and think of three things that you feel grateful for, it really changes how the state inside your body and it switches you over from fear and negativity to positivity and that really helps. So that's another really important trick. Yeah, that that's a great one, uh, especially a lot of folks say the whole purpose of meditation, which people do to be more mindful and and conquer stress if you will is to catch yourself in the millisecond before the stimulus which is somebody said something to you and your response right if you, if you can catch some yourself in the middle and as you as you mentioned find things you're grateful for then you can alter your body's response your brain's response to that situation in a great way yeah so I feel that um, managing your stress and moving your body are super important lifestyle habits if we want to maintain brain health. Okay, great. Now let's move on to my favorite question that I ask every guest. Dr. Matthew, what are your top three anti-aging hacks? Yeah, so my first anti-aging hack has got to be to eat fat. So all these years we told everybody to be on a low-fat diet but it turns out we were wrong. It matters what kind of fat you eat. It has to be the good fat, but eat fat. Fat is good for your brain. The second one um, I would say is intermittent fasting. We didn't really talk about that today, but when you intermittent fast, when you, when you go for short periods of time with lower calories, it allows your cells to do kind of routine maintenance and cleanup and um, really helps you to stay healthier. And the third one would be to be grateful. So whatever's going on in your life, if you can be grateful, it really changes the chemistry in your body and it makes you a lot more healthy. Those are great. Thank you. I have a follow-on question because we talked about the fats and the types of fats. On the intermittent fasting, obviously this is a great modality to improve a lot of uh, things in your life, but also your body and anti-age. I do a 16-8 protocol pretty, pretty much every day. So 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of eating. I believe, and there's been um, some folks saying that for women, they shouldn't, because of the hormones, you shouldn't do a 16-8. The maximum you should do in terms of fasting is 12. What's your position on that? You know, I do 16-8 I do and eight as well, and I'm watching the research, and we'll see what they say. So the jury is out, and um, I haven't found problems in my patients. People are feeling good, um, so we'll have to see what the research shows. Okay, great. I'm glad uh, you're watching the research because I'm not. and <laughs> would, love to, would love to get updated when you find uh, which yeah. way science decides we should do it. Uh, awesome. You also have a book. Do you want to tell our listeners about the book? Sure. So when people come to see me, the, a lot of times 
people come because they feel that they have a hormone problem. That's sort of my um, area of specialty. And a lot of times what I hear them say is, you know, here's my symptoms. I'm tired. I'm anxious. I can't lose that belly fat. I'm not sleeping well. You know, they've got a whole list of symptoms and they say, and I'm not sure if it might be my hormones. So it's hard to know whether whatever symptoms you're having are because of a hormone problem. And so I wrote a book to help women understand whether they could have a hormone problem. It's called, This is Not Normal, A Busy Woman's Guide to Symptoms of Hormone Imbalance. It has a bunch of quizzes, you know, so you can go through and check off your symptoms to kind of predict, could it be a thyroid problem? Could it be a cortisol problem? Is it more of like PMS or perimenopause or menopause? So that women can understand what's going on in their body and start to find solutions that aren't necessarily prescription pills. That's great. I'm going to link to a lot of the studies we discussed as well as your book in the show notes of this episode. So thank you for sharing. Dr. Matthew, how can our listeners follow your work and find out more about you online? Yeah. So um, on my practice website, signaturewellness.org, we have uh, blog posts and all kinds of information um, so that they can learn some more. Great. So I'll link to that as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew, for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. You can find all the information we discussed in this episode and links to studies in the show notes at antiaginghacks.net. To make sure you get notified of new episodes, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at antiaginghacks and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash antiaginghacks. And now for the disclaimers. This podcast is for general information purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. Please seek the advice of your health professional for any health or medical conditions.